is time for side stitches yet again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a, uh, I would say a, a callback to the to the side stitches of yesterday. I would say yesteryear, but we haven't even been doing this for a year. Um, it's, the, it's the same year. It's the same year, but like later in that earlier. year. <laughs> yeah, like it was earlier, where it was it was just the two of us because Chelsea is at an emergency wedding. Yeah, two people decided they loved each other. And they wanted to bet everything on on their lives being together. Uh, so Chelsea's like, yeah, yeah, I have to witness that. So that's where she is. So was, uh, sadly, Chelsea is not with us on this week's side stitch. But fortunately, she is with us uh, on our interview with with Josh Sawyer of Obsidian Entertainment. That'll be debuting in just a few days. So before we get to that, we wanted to do is for the folks that may not know who Josh Sawyer is. Um, you know, which we both kind of find surprising and shocking since we're, we're big gaming fans. We mm-hmm. live this stuff day in and day out. Uh, but no, seriously, for those of you who don't know who Josh Sawyer is, um, we're going to go into quite a bit of that with the man himself and talk about his background a little bit. Um, but even as detailed as we, we were able to get in our interview, there are some things that we might reference a little bit that, um, that we don't get to expand on very much because we wanted yeah. to optimize that time, right? Yeah, we, and also we wanted... <laughs> We really wanted to make sure we were talking about uh, Josh himself and not focusing just on his work. Yeah. As yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. So, mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Some of those like work, like specific questions, um, we kind of spent more time on like the methodology behind them and, mm-hmm. you know, the creative process and, and some of his thoughts on things. But ultimately what I thought was uh, important here, because we've, we've talked about a lot of history regarding certain you know, subjects, certain topics, uh, whether it's a franchise, a TV show, you know, an actor. And in this case, there's a lot of cool history that we wanted to still shed some light on because um, Josh has been in the industry for over 20 years uh, in the gaming industry. He's helped make some pretty important uh, computer-based RPGs, uh, some that have been you know, making their way to consoles as well. Um but one of the, the first positions he had was as a, a web developer uh, for Black Isle Studios, which was a, an arm of Interplay. So Interplay Productions was founded in, I believe, 1983. I only remember that because it was the year before my brother was born. Um, but <laughs> either way, <laughs> uh, Interplay Productions, they're, they're still around. And the reason why um, I remember Interplay, not just because of their logo, but it's because they're they're actually responsible for some pretty big, you know, series out there. Um, you know, Baldur's Gate is obviously a very big one. A lot mm-hmm. of the RPG folks will be familiar with that. Um, but for us '90s kids, you might remember Clay Fighter. Oh, who could forget Clay Fighter? Oh my gosh! <laughs> like <laughs> it's it's definitely 3D graphics that push the limits of what claymation Christmas movies could do. If they were violent and on the Super Nintendo. Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, dude. Uh, Clay Fighter, also Earthworm Jim. They would be behind that. Earthworm Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, not probably. Um, I don't think they're behind the the short lived animated series of Earthworm Jim, though. Probably not. Probably not. uh, Not their thing. Yeah. For those of you who are devotees to this program, uh, the animated spinoffs of our favorite video game characters didn't always go very well <laughs> no no they didn't excuse me oh my god <laughs> princess <laughs> oh like i think they uh before like they didn't make link talk just because like you know maybe he's just as silent and everything's great and then they finally let him talk like you know what he never gets to talk again after yeah. after that cartoon he's done he's had enough see what I always thought would be funny is like they finally let him start talking and it's just Randy Newman. <laughs> <laughs> hey, princess. Uh, you, you were in the right castle. You know, that, that would be horrible. But anyway. Be horrible. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, dude, Inter- Interplay uh, would also be responsible for what a lot of uh, the fans of Josh Sawyer would become familiar with. So, Interplay um, actually was the studio behind the original Fallout games. So Fallout 1 and 2. Mm-hmm. I think they also did Fallout Tactics, which you know Josh talks about a little bit. He was actually a really big fan of the Fallout Tactics game that came out. Um, 
but uh, ultimately for Josh, he wouldn't get to work on a, you know, a fallout game until the, uh, what was supposed to be the original fallout three before mm-hmm. Bethesda got its hands on the, the rights because interplay lost the rights to the fallout franchise. Um, so unfortunately for Josh at that time, he had been working on what was called Van Buren. And yeah, the if you've president ever, naming system. Yes. Yes. If you have scoured uh, any Josh Sawyer, you know, wiki pages, that was one of the things he helped implement uh, when he was working, you know, on these games. It was all about the presidential names, Mm -hmm. mostly because they wanted to be able to talk about their projects while they were, you know, out having lunch back before the the COVID days, right? When you could go to a (laughs) diner and actually have food and not be worried Mm -hmm. about catching a pandemic, you know, illness. Um, Talking about your projects over, over a bite to eat was you know, pretty important. So yeah. And I, I assumed it was due to his time with the Van Buren boys, which we all know is a very prominent, prominent East coast um, gang. Yeah. And you do not want to mess with the VB boys. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to flash their symbol, which we won't tell you because only those that know, know. Mm -hmm. but (laughs) (laughs) um, (laughs) well, to round out some of the interplay stuff though, uh, Icewind Dale, which was based on uh, obviously D and D, uh yeah mario teaches typing game which, uh, which i loved like that was that was my saving <laughs> grace like of all the boring crap education that i got in like elementary middle school my catholic school that i was basically forced to go to um and asked to transfer many times to public education in my young life uh mario teaches typing was definitely a high point of every day <laughs> when i got to just <laughs> Pipe and send Mario through his digital world and hopefully not screw up in time for a for a Goomba or Koopa Trooper to come and get me before I could hit that damn Q button. Dude, isn't that hilarious, man? Like, this is <laughs> stuff that I never thought I would ever have to talk about again. Um, but the truth is, Nintendo, they they didn't just do this with, uh, you know, X or uh, what is it we want to call it here? Like, kicking out some of their IP for other people to make games. Like, we talked about, you know, how they did that uh, with Philips and the CDI and mm-hmm. those, the Zelda games that they they let kicked out. And and this was the Mario educational games, you know, circuit <laughs> that lasted from, like, 88, I think, to uh, the mid-90s. Mm-hmm. Which, honestly, much better on Nintendo. <laughs> and really more of it seeming like a Nintendo thing. I feel like that's just a, a fairly wholesome company that they decide, like, yeah, let's let's make mario into something educational that sounds like a great use of our time and property um as opposed to i I mean i should i I, it's even it does make sense but maybe i'm also being too harsh on those those terrible zelda games for the pc and it's just because the gameplay was fine it's just the cutscenes that were nightmare inducing (laughs) is is what damned them yeah and to be honest with you i think it actually would probably have helped more students if if there were educational games made with characters they recognized, yeah, you know, I, I think it's a, agree. it's a, yeah, it's a good platform, but either way that, yeah. you know, interplay um, would be, would be known for that. And, uh, and after, you know, fallout, of course, they'd also be known for wasteland as well, which was the, you know, the spiritual uh, well, I guess it's the spiritual proto version of fallout. Right. We talked about mm-hmm. a little bit about that in our RPG uh, history series. So, uh, at, at one point, you might be asking, why is Josh not working for Interplay anymore? Or at least the Black Isle Studios division of Interplay. Well, well Interplay had a little bit of a uh, little bit of problems with some some money. Yeah, some, they they did hit some financial woes there. Yeah, they had to unfortunately uh, show the door to some of the folks at Black Isle Studios. And, you know, th- we won't go through, you know, Josh's, uh, you know, work history line by line or anything. but just like a lot of other uh, engineering industries here or engineering style industries, you have, you, you have some of these designers and some of these personalities that go off and do their own thing. You know, they're kind of, I, I always use this, um, this analogy of like schools of fish, right? They all kind of follow the same uh, tide or the same current mm-hmm. and they may not always be together at the exact same time, but they still find their way to each other. And so, um, Obsidian Entertainment would spin off of that, right? Like some of the the folks that left Black Isle Studios um, would end Wound up, up yeah. finding, mm-hmm. yeah, Obsidian Entertainment. So, um, so that's that's a ba- basically why Josh ended up there. Um, now, in the in the interview with him, um, he actually does mention uh, Fargus, 
uh, Fargus or Quart, I believe is his, his name. I always have a hard time pronouncing that. Um, but also Chris Parker, Chris Avalone, uh, Darren Monahan, and Chris Jones would, would found Obsidian Entertainment. Um, and I believe that was in, it was the early 2000s. I think it was like 2003 or 2004. So, yeah. So it was so shortly was after A Night's Tale came out. That's what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. oh my god shortly after the night's yeah, night's tale which uh which we, we do bring up with josh we do bring uh, up with enough. josh <laughs> 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 That's great. um well and, and for those of you that um you've probably seen obsidian entertainment before right because i and joe you mentioned this uh how you don't always pay attention to the names that are attached to a game or sometimes you just click that button to cycle through who the publisher was or the developer was that I do. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't uh, put it I, before the yeah. game, I'm probably going to miss it. Gonna... <laughs> Even then well, there's really no guarantee. Like I was a pretty idiotic child and I just nailed that button so fast. And I just get me to the game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't blame you for that. Yeah. I don't blame you for that at all. I, 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 I obviously a little bit different. I tend to spend a little bit more time <laughs> uh, looking into who the people were that made the games because Believe it or not, Joe, there was a time when nerd culture was underserved. And what? so if you, f- yeah, believe it or not, right? What? No, uh, we've always been on the top. We've always been the coolest kids in school. Oh, yeah. We were just constantly at the top of the, of the pecking order. He, he, this is a podcast. You can't see me rolling my eyes. But, <laughs> um, but ultimately, Obsidian Entertainment uh, became known for some pretty awesome licensed properties, um, specifically Knights of the Old Republic 2 from Star Wars, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then uh, Neverwinter Nights as well. So these are actually both uh, Bioware projects that uh, would end up getting kind of, I don't know if I call it like outsourced or um, passed to a different studio to develop, but Ultimately, they worked with Obsidian Entertainment to uh, continue those games. And Josh would actually uh, get involved on Neverwinter Nights 2, as well as um, then Alpha Protocol would be the next game that Obsidian would would run with his involvement. And then for a lot of folks, the first time they saw Josh's name was on, you know, Fallout New Vegas, which he was the project director of. Um, We will leave a good amount of that story for Josh to tell himself because mm-hmm. um, he actually goes into that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and believe it or not, and, it's better uh, to hear it from him because he lived it. He, li- <laughs> he lived it. Just, <laughs> just like the people in the Star Wars, he's telling the story. He was um, he was Josh Sawyer in Josh Sawyer. <laughs> yeah. uh, unlike Ernie Hudson, he did not get recast as himself <laughs> oh, trying to poor, voice himself. So Poor Ernie Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too bad. Uh uh, you know what? I think my favorite part of our our conversation there, and I and I once again, we don't want to blow this because mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of good stuff that Josh goes into, but it's really just the idea that in in the industry, in the gaming industry, for those of you that if you are aspiring and want to get into it, um, Josh goes into this a couple times where you know he started off as a web developer. You know, he mm-hmm. knew Java, he he knew some technologies that at the time were. Or Flash, sorry, Flash. You knew yes, Flash. Flash, um, Flash three is very good resume builder. I mean, not anymore. Do not put well, Flash on that resume anymore. Don't put it like yeah. bad idea. But well, once maybe, upon a time, <laughs> maybe if you're interviewing with Josh Sawyer, put it on there maybe, and just see yeah. if he notices because mm-hmm. <laughs> he definitely he probably will say something. Uh, we're sorry, Josh, if you're mm-hmm. listening. But um, but ultimately, yeah, yeah, it, it was uh, it was really cool to understand just how he could go from you know from web developer to you know, literally a, a project director and a design director. So, mm-hmm. um, so very, very cool uh, journey that he went through and as well as the journey of, what, as we mentioned, Obsidian Entertainment, because uh, the thing I always found the most interesting about them was that they became known as like the RPG guys. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they made some really <laughs> awesome RPGs, especially mm-hmm. uh, as, as like uh, computer-based strategy games and, computer rpgs you know in the mid 90s late 90s they really started to catch Mm -hmm. fire and so it was just really cool to see uh you know josh's career start to blossom out of that that uh that growth and so either way it was uh it was a really fun 
conversation to be a part of. And uh, honestly, it makes me wish I would have went back in time and tried to get into gaming, if anything. Because <laughs> 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 oh, mm-hmm. uh, we, yeah. we make a joke a lot in sales, Joe, that um, sometimes it feels like we're in the wrong business, you know, and and uh, I'm not going to say that I, I regret my career outside mm-hmm. of podcasting, but <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, I wish my creativity could have gone towards something, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like an RPG type of project. But, um, but yeah, I guess uh, from from that though, from the Obsidian Entertainment discussion, um, I, I thought it was really cool to 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 just kind of look between the lines of where gaming started, and you know where Josh thinks it's going to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, for those of you that want to do this research and look into it, um, Josh has actually spoken on this topic many times, obviously. I mean, he's, yeah, this is, he's, this he's is done. He does. Yeah. I mean, he's done uh, <laughs> keynote speeches at, uh, at different conferences and universities, uh, talking about this. He's got uh, interviews that are in magazines, um, which if you're not familiar, they are paper. Um, they have covers, letters and pictures in them physical things but they also have online divisions where you could go to find them as well if you don't like the whole physical paper thing anymore uh but yeah he's talked about it uh, quite a bit so um if you want to have his opinion on it check it out uh just look him up you'll find <laughs> you'll definitely find uh what he has to say about it but one thing that i particularly enjoy in this conversation is um he talks about seeing some of those like 70s like uh multi-user dungeon games that we talked about in our rpg episode that like yeah. he actually played them and he like he like, him going from like just doing tabletop stuff to seeing it digitally and just yeah. mind was blown and what and what that did to him uh as as a kid and how that just amplified his love for the uh, for the rpg genre yeah, and in, and in particular, the, the rules, mm-hmm. right? Like the 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 guiding principles of what makes uh, an RPG a fun experience. But also, I, I would say more importantly, um, you know, th- there are some philosophical things that that Josh refers to in our conversation, and some of it we didn't have enough time to really dig into because I absolutely wish we could. Um, but. I would say, you know, the, one of the most important things, especially if you get to talk to, to people like Josh or, or really anyone who's been a part of their industry as long as he has, you know, I, I would say the, the highest value statements that you can get have nothing to do with actually playing the games. Mm-hmm. And it's really more about the relationships that, that uh, Josh has talked about. You, you alluded to it a little bit where it was the idea of meeting someone who played a game who knew someone else and you learned different rules uh, that you didn't even know about, you know, different aspects of the game you didn't know about. And Josh mentions this as a, as a big part of, you know, his job was seeking out different perspectives and different people and not just waiting for them to come to you because back then, yeah, this was something you had to do almost by choice or you had to do it by luck, finding people, Mm -hmm. And Josh has learned that through his career that you can't expect someone to find you. You, you got to go look them out. You've got to do what's uncomfortable. You got to go find people that, that maybe you wouldn't have tried to before. Um, and so from a, a life lesson standpoint, um, I, I think from Josh, he points out a couple important things that we talked about in the, uh, the conversation we actually had before the call or before the interview. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he mentions that it's critically important to do what you're passionate about, uh, things like time management, you know, not living so much in your job and understanding what the difference is between being, you know, being obviously involved in your job, mm-hmm. but still saving time for other things, you know, your job shouldn't be 365. No, you know, no, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's important too, because uh, if you look into any of the metrics or some of the stats that come out of the gaming industry, most people are only in it for five years. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty quick burnout and turnover where they just, you know, decide that uh, gaming 
much more fun to do in free time as opposed to designing and making it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, totally, man. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, I also really appreciated getting to ask about the future of the industry, mm -hmm. um, which once again, we're not going to ruin for you, but, um, in some bonus content later this week, we will release this on the blog too, about, um, some thoughts from, from Josh on, on where the industry is going to go. We, we expand on it a little bit in the episode, but um, there's some really cool things that, uh, that he kind of mentions about indie developers and, and how the industry kind of started off as an indie industry, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and throughout the, the past, you know, 40 years or so, almost 50 years, mm -hmm. uh, RPGs kind of ballooned into this massive industry, you know, backed by big money. And now we're seeing it go back to independent developers who are now innovating it again. It's, it's a really mm -hmm. interesting, you know, trajectory. Um, so yeah, these are all things that uh, we'll cover a little bit later this week, but we want to give you a little bit of, uh, I guess, background of the background, as Josh would say, <laughs> His college major mm -hmm. was understanding the history of history. history. <laughs> <laughs> so we got mm -hmm. a little meta with it this week, folks. But um, at the same time, this is a very long interview, um, but at, there's, a, there's so much value packed into it that we really hope you enjoy it because um, we did. I mean, mm -hmm. hell, by the time that interview ended, I went, I, this did not feel like <laughs> it didn't feel this long like holy mm -hmm. crap like what what happened it's night 